You're listening to The Broken Meeple Show, a podcast that speaks passionately about board games for the benefit of those who play them. My name's Luke Hector, best known for The Broken Meeple YouTube channel, and I'm an everyday gamer just like you. And I'll be talking about reviews, top tens, and just about anything that connects me to board games. As long as I have a tea or coffee in hand, that is. So grab a cup, relax, and enjoy. And remember, it's only a game. Morning everybody! Whoa, camera's a little bit close to my face there, let's pull that back a bit, which obviously doesn't affect you in audio country. Yes, this is Luke Hector doing another podcast on 17th of September 2023, and whew, it's been a bit of a long few, long couple of weeks I must say, but in a 99% positive way. I mean, it's a, you know, there was one blemish, but for the most part, pretty sweet. Um, I basically, well, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but uh, suffice to say, all pretty good. Um, tr- obviously, things are pretty hectic in the moment because, you know, September is quite a busy month for me job-wise. There's a lot of reviews to get done. There's a lot of games on my shelf of shame I want to get played for personal reasons. But then there's also, you know, Essen is coming around the corner, which means I'm trying to prep for that. I've got, you know, some time set up with uh, some, you know, publishers trying to arrange, you know, if review copies are going to be collected there or posted after the fact, or if I'm going to get them at all, you know, which ones will I buy, you know, what I've got to take, arranging transport, you know, I've got to ship Paul Grogan across the, <laughs> across the channel uh, again, you know, we tend to go as a, a twosome, I drive and he sleeps is basically the arrangement, but if it cuts my travel costs in half, then, you know, what the hell. And then we'll be at the, I think it's the holiday, I think it's the Premier Inn. Uh, it's the Premier Inn in the middle of Essen, which is right next to the train station. Um, you know, Paul's usually in there, I'm in there, Hilmar from Midgard's in there, uh, Mark Monk from Ninja Geek Games will be in there. There's quite a few people uh, that tend to hang around in that specific hotel. So I'll be in there sharing a room with Hilmar, and it just means that in the evenings, if we're not out at the pub, we'll be there playing games, table permitting, and it'll just be a good social time time so I think the evenings at Essen are going to be pretty sweet once I'm done with the day. Uh, I will be helping uh, at uh, Greater Than Games again at Essen. Now there was a meet, well before I get to that, no actually let's continue with that, you know Greater Than Games yes I'm there on I think Friday afternoon and Saturday afternoon so I'm doing two afternoon shifts for a middle of the day to end of the day and I'll be at Greater Than Games booth. Unfortunately, I won't be demoing Sem- Sentinels like I normally would like to. Um, I guess maybe they're not demoing it this year, or perhaps people just took up the slots before I got in on it. But apparently I'm demoing something called Pyramid Pyramido or Pyramid Pyramido or something. I don't know. It's like a new abstract game that they've uh, kind of bringing out or are bringing out in conjunction with someone else. Don't know the game very much at all. Is it good? Is it bad? I've no idea. I've literally just got to learn it in advance somehow, you know, and teach it over those two half days. But, you know, if you want to say hi, then by all means, come along and play the game because it's a short game. It won't take you very long to learn. It's only a it's pretty much like a two-player abstract game as far as I'm aware. So it should be pretty easy enough to teach and play. And then you can chat to me while you're there. Now, I did look up meet and greet events, but there is a meet and greet event but it was so poorly advertised that I don't think anyone's really in it because last year I think Spiel did it, I'm not sure, but then this year it seems that somebody else has taken over, like a third party is arranging this at Spiel and it's taking place there and it basically allows you to go for about four hours and you know meet and greet people as a content creator. The problem is is that I never heard about this event. It's not advertised anywhere on the Spiel site so we don't get any emails about it. Literally, I found it by chance. I Google searched it and by fluke found it. That was the only way I found it. And, you know, it's arranged by someone else and I could have signed up. But the problem is, Saturday afternoon, I'm helping out greater than games then, so I can't really pull out. But also, when you look at the exhibitors that are there, apart from maybe one or two, there's really no one I recognize there. It is mostly, I think, for German creators. So I've never heard of a lot of these people. You know, there's a couple of American ones there. But other than that, there's just so few, like, well-known people, as far as I'm aware, in there. So it just seemed pointless for me to even try to get into the event. You know, if people can just find me inside the convention and say hi and shake my hand, that's perfect, you know, or find me at Greater in Games booth. That'll do, frankly. You know, I'll usually sort of message on Twitter and, you know, Facebook posts, you know, where I am and stuff. But and availing that, you know, come to the Premier Inn or whatever it is. Um, let's see if I can find it, actually, while I'm on the screen. But 
you know, I, it just didn't seem necessary to bother with it. So let's see, Premiere in Essen. Let's see if it is the one I'm thinking of. Uh, Premiere in Essen City Center Hotel. I, the problem is I can't tell if it's Premiere in or Holiday in or Holiday Express or what. They all basically are the same to me. So I don't know what <laughs> the difference is between them. But let's have a look. So let's see. Essen. That's the Essen Hauf Bahnhof. All right. So somewhere around here. Yeah, there's a little location here. There is a. All right. Yeah. So it's the Premier Inn Essen City Center Hotel. That's that's where we'll be. So you know, I'll be there in the evening. So you know, you'll look it up on the look it up on the interweb. It's this one with the picture here. But um, you yeah, know, Premier Inn Essen City Center Hotel is what it will basically Google as. That is where, but by Am Haft Bahnhof, which is basically the main train station. So by all means, you can always catch me in the evening there if you happen to be in the area and you just want to chat or play some games. So, you know, I am available to find, shall we say. All right, uh, so in terms of the uh, blog, not too bad. 2848 in terms of subscriber count. That is climbing. We're getting very close to the 21,000 mark already. So, you know, great to see that. Not a huge amount of content in the last couple of weeks, mainly because of Midgard. But, uh, you know, I was able to at least resurrect my Keep or Cull series, which I'm so sad to say got sidetracked. You know, I will keep that going. Uh, did the other podcast. Did Nature Incarnate beyond the base game review? So uh, I played the hell out of Spirit Island when that expansion got uh, released in the UK, that is. I know backers are still waiting for theirs. I'm so sorry about that. And, you know, I just basically had a lot of, you know, time to play it. And, yep, I did the review for it, and it's doing pretty well. Nearly 3,000 views. It's taken a little while. I published it over a week ago. But you know what? Beyond the base game videos do not get a lot of... um. Uh, was it a lot of views a lot of the time because of expansion so for a beyond the base game video to get as many views as a typical review i'm pretty happy with that and then leaf check that video out this is a small gateway game that i swear is going to fall under the radar for so many people and it really deserves not to because it ticks all the boxes that a good gateway game should i think it's going to be horrendously underrated because it's you know weird city games it's not the most well-known publisher in the world and you know gateway games these days get you know so much like not so much stick but they get ignored you know you, you go on go on board game geek and browse all the games that have been released in 2023 so far, just 2023, no expansions, go to that list on BGG. Look through the first, say, 200 games that you find on there and tell me how many of those you would consider to be a gateway game. There's loads of them that are all epic RPG simulators, open-ended games, giant Euros, heavy Euros, and it's just like gateway games are just forgotten about now, as if like we're, we're, we're almost closing the doors to our hobby now and just sticking to ourselves, which is not the way I want things to go. So check that Leaf video out and thumb it up on YouTube and thumb it up on Board Game Geek. Let's get it in the hat review section because I think the game needs to be talked about more. And if you want to know why, then check out the review itself. Uh, you know, it's not doing too well at the moment, but there is more content on the way. You know, I've got the Beyond the Base Game video for Lost Ruins of Arnak uh, Hidden Expeditions is uh, re recorded I just need to edit it hopefully I'll get time today but that will be the next video to release and hopefully with a new promo not to say that Kienda is not a sponsor anymore no 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 they're still a sponsor but uh, I have gone out of my way to try and find a couple of local people to sort of sponsor a video every now and again and I found a local coffee supplier that uh, does a uh, coffee for gamers so uh, they're called meeplecoffee.co.uk i won't say too much more now but uh, when that video comes out you'll see that as a promo at the start like for about 30 seconds just like the normal kienda one is you know it's not going to be quite as like extravagant as the uh, kienda one because this one's just going to run for a short time and then it'll stop but or i might bring it back every now and again but the, it's just like it's basically a cheap promo so you know by all means check that out when it comes out other than that, nothing else is recorded, but I have Everdell Farshore on the uh, review pile from Kiender. So, yep, that's going to get reviewed fairly soon, actually, because, frankly, the the rules are so similar to Everdell. It's basically Everdell 1.25. And so, realistically, it's not going to take me that long to learn the game. You know, I've already, like, because if I know Everdell, which I already do, I already know 90% of this game. And then you know, I just need to get it played and getting it played solo will be easy at my house and getting it played multiplayer will be easy peasy because every club I go to has Everdell fans. So people are going to be gnawing at my arm to try and get this played. So that one should see a pretty quick turnaround in terms of its review. 
Other than that, what else? Uh, oh yeah, City of the Great Machine. That still needs to get reviewed also from Kienda, actually. And that one is going to be tricky because there's quite a few rules. It's quite involved. It's a one versus many game. That might take a little longer to get reviewed. So, you know, you'll just have to bear with me on that one. Uh, maybe I'll do a solo review perspective of it. I don't know, but it's just a hard one to get done and dusted. I'm trying to think if there's any others. I mean, I'm trying to get stuff played off my shelf of shame, like Massive Darkness 2. That needs to get played very soon. Uh, the Lost Rooms of Arnak expansion, you know, I, I was playing that a lot lately, so I had to play lots of Arnak games, and uh, I don't think there's much else that I desperately, well, Planetarium, Planetarium is like another Euro game that I bought ages ago, randomly on sale, and I've still yet to play it, uh, I'm trying to think what else, I swear I've got other stuff, oh yeah, of course, more on, um, Deep Rock Galactic finally arrived on my doorstep. Finally. I mean, for crying out loud, how long have I waited for Deep Rock Galactic to come through? This is the last time I am doing a group pledge for anything because it just delays things so much and it's too much faff that I refuse to just bother with a group pledge again. I don't care if it gets you a small discount. It's not worth it. I'm just going to bid solo from now on. But yeah, Finally, this is now in my collection. I have now unpacked it. I just need to learn the rules and play it, and I cannot wait. I have not played this computer game for a while now, I must admit. I mean, playing other stuff lately like Valheim and Hades. Uh, Hades I bought recently, I'm trying out, which I'm enjoying so far, and a couple of other PC games. But yeah, Deep Rock Galactic is still something I've sunk over 500 hours in. It's still fantastic. So you know, it's still a game I cannot wait to get to the table. On top of that, uh, Snowdale Designs, after I asked them, I asked them for review copies. And sadly, I couldn't get a copy of the prototype for um, Peacemakers or whatever it's called, the uh, new game they've got on Kickstarter. But oh, when I get around to doing a Kickstarter review for September, because I can't remember if I did one for August, I need to do one for September Sharpish. Uh, but... You know, when I get there, I'll talk about that Kickstarter then. But it was, they wanted a very quick turnaround and there was no way I was going to do it before Essen. It was just not going to happen. So I said, you know what, just send me a release, send me a proper copy when it's out on retail. I'll review it then. But they have sent me Lands of Galzier. And this one's had a decent amount of buzz from uh, some board gaming community, particularly uh, Dice Tower. Uh, Mike Delisio in particular really liked this one. And I love De La Merchants. It's one of my favorite deck builders. And I love this sort of cutesy animal sort of world and artwork. An open-ended light game. I'm down for it. I've unboxed it. It looks beautiful. And I really need to get stuck into this solo. So uh, this one should be pretty, pretty cool. And wait a minute. Oh, you can get this on the app as well. Oh, I, oh yes, because there's learning tutorial videos. I better get stuck into this one sharpish because, I mean, look at it. It looks so good, doesn't it? Can't wait to stick my hand in this one. And I probably need to do it sharpish because it won't be too long before Earthborn Rangers comes out on uh, Kickstarter. Which is really annoying because originally when I arranged to do a review of this, we were hoping it was going to arrive in July or early August at the latest. So that I could get a review done before even the Americans got it. But because I live in the UK, everything sucks here and everything coming to the UK sucks which means it's been delayed, and I think we're going to get it fulfilled in the next month, I think, or certainly in the next few weeks, maybe even before Essen, I should expect to see this turn up on my doorstep, but sadly, some people have already done written reviews for it, I mean, by the time I get around to playing it a ton, maybe the video reviews have already started coming out, but yeah, I'm going to be a little bit late to the party with this one, which is a bit of a shame, really, but... That's not going to damper my excitement for getting the game. I still think the game was fantastic from the demo I played, and I'm definitely keen to stick my head in this one. But, yeah, the rest of the year is going to be pretty busy, and uh, more on that in a minute with terms of... Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. So, yeah, all pretty good. Lots of stuff to come. So, what was this Midgard that I was talking about? Well... I spent the weekend in Midgard uh, from like last weekend, a few days, thanks to my mate Hilmar for uh, getting me as a guest to be invited to this con. It was smaller than I thought it was. I mean, um, the advertising makes it look a little bit bigger than it actually is. It's, it's probably in comparison to your local city con, you know, Portsmouth Comic Con, you know, stuff like that. It's not like a huge thing, but it is just a nice intimate gathering. I mean, there's, you know, people selling various uh, um, memorabilia for all the geeky stuff. There's a bit of the Star Wars, a bit of anime, a bit of cosplay, a bit of sci-fi, there's a bit of fantasy, a bit of RPG, a bit of open gaming, board gaming, you know, there's, there's a kind of a mixed bag of everything and it's just 
a collection of friendly people. I mean, man, the Iceland, the Icelanders are friendly people. You know, they felt they made us feel welcome. Everybody at the convention treated us like royalty. And as a guest, I got the same treatment as the actors did, with the exception of security details, obviously. But yeah, you know, they fed us like lunch and dinner. They they had alcohol for us on on demand we could get all the water we wanted there were snacks and we had our own room i mean man they treated us so well i did not deserve that kind of treatment i mean this is me some schmuck on youtube we, you know with twenty thousand plus subscribers what do i deserve in terms of that kind of treatment i'm not going to say no to it but it's still like really do i deserve that kind of thing you know compared to actors that were there i mean i was there hanging out with you know jewel stafe and sean maher from firefly you know, that fantastic series, I got to meet them and hang out with them and go sightseeing with them. It was great. And uh, there was a couple of other guys really cool as well. Uh, Joe Flanagan and Paul McGillian. I had to look those up because they are actors from Stargate Atlantis, which I've sadly never watched. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not a massive, uh, mid I'm not a massive Stargate fan. But, you know, you know, Joe sort of kept to himself a lot, but Paul was very chatty. Paul was your quintessential, stereotypical, chatty, expressive American, you know, like with the accent and everything. It was just, you know, really, it was all really, uh, or was he Canadian? I forget. But either way, it was just like, you know, he's the, he's the, the, the light of the room. He's constantly sort of chatting and talking to people and stuff, you know, and they were just really friendly folk. All the uh, all the security detail that they had, you know, they were friendly folk, you know, they were chatty. I got driven to and from the airport, and that's like a 45-minute journey or something. I mean, man, man, they treated us so well there. And, you know, I was mopping it up, but it just felt weird, you know, for someone like me to get that kind of treatment, you know, some schmuck. But, hey, it was a good fun time. And I basically just there hanging out with people like Dave and Ilka Loser from Loser Palooza and, you know, uh, above board were there doing some filming sketches. And we hung out, we went out for meals, we did some open gaming and, you know, I played a lot of board games, treat, uh, tra t um, taught a bunch of people that were attending the con who pretty much nine, probably 100% didn't know me, which is... Bit of a shame. Some people recognise Dave and Ilka Loser, although not many, which is surprising. I mean, you'd think that more people would know them, but yeah, pretty much nobody knew who I was. I mean, it's like, who on earth knows me at all? But at the end of the day, that kind of helped because it meant I didn't really have to care too much about, you know, like publicising the channel or anything like that. I could just be like, you know what? I'm just here to help. I'm a guest. You don't know who I am. You don't really care, but let's play some games. And Certainly, the people who are teaching, teaching games to were very grateful for the teachers, uh, and it was just a good, friendly time. Now, it was and Monday, we got to go sightseeing, so I got to see gazers, I got to see volcanic craters, uh, I got to see, um, you know, like black sand, well, what the little there was of a black sand beach. Uh, we got to eat out, went to a Viking themed restaurant. I tried everything from fermented shark to, uh, you know, boiled sheep's head and you know, weird sort of meat concoctions, including one in one type of fish in particular that I won't say because it's a little controversial. But you know, other than that, it was. And then I got to have one of the best meads I've ever had. You know, a coffee and honey blend mead. Oh, that was very nice. You know, Icelandic beer, very nice. Uh, their fish is very good. I had a fish pan, like, in cheese sauce. It was like, oh, it was really delicious. So, yeah, it was just, it was just a good time. It was slightly marred, however, because one touristy restaurant we went to on the sightseeing day, which I just grabbed a fish and chips on, kind of cocked up their service and cocked up the food because I got food poisoning as well as one or two other people. Now, uh, that was a problem because it meant that, that I had a very rough night and I was only going to get three, four hours sleep anyway because of the flight. But yeah, it meant I couldn't sleep and then I had to try and stay in, a, in one piece for a 45-minute car journey uh, for a 45-minute queue at the airport just to check my bag in, a further queue in order to check in itself, and then the more queues, and then walking around the airport, and then a two-and-a-half-hour, three-hour flight, and then, you know, a bus journey to my car, and then getting home, I had to endure all that with chronic food poisoning. And, yeah, um, not good. Had a very big dehydration fever headache. Uh, you know, I was I was ill several times. You know, nausea took over, especially after the bus journey. That just wiped me out. And by the time I got home, I was just like exhausted. I had to get a kip, had to get a nap. Thankfully, I do feel better. I do feel better for the most part. I do have a, a bit of a swollen tonsils problem at the moment, though. So 
throat issues as well, but that's an after effect of the food poisoning because you, you get an infection and you fight it off and then something else flares up. And basically, as much as I'm over the food poisoning now, I'm totally recovered from that. I do still have swollen tonsils now, which flared up afterwards. And it's just like, oh, great. Now, I have checked myself for COVID before anybody asks. I'm negative, so don't worry, I haven't got COVID. It's just literally one of those things. Does not mar my experience for Midgard though. It's a small convention, you're pretty much there for a day max, and even then it's a wide breadth of stuff. You're not it's not like Games Expo or something huge. It's a nice small convention with a big team that runs it with a few sponsors and a lot of volunteers. They just they see it as a passion project and you can see that with the way they arrange things and there's just a good crowd there. You know, people who just want to be there, you know, because you know, I can't imagine there's many, much of this stuff in Iceland, you know, on an island. So the fact that this exists is just a, a really cool thing. And, you know, if they'll help me back next year, I'll certainly consider it because Iceland was just a really good place to visit. Hope to go back there for some proper visits and, you know, and do more sightseeing, maybe some of the wintry stuff. Uh, but yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Hopefully I'll see you guys again. All right. Uh, let's talk about the game I played at... Uh, uh, the, the convention actually because I taught mostly games I'd already played or Leaf I'd already reviewed I, I played that quite a few uh, a few times quite an eye catcher but finally oh my god finally let me take a drink first uh, give my tonsils a bit of a swill right Hilmar was very 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 kind to teach me this because finally oh my word I've been wanting to play Mosaic a story of civilization for a long time because I I'd heard about it I saw it on Kickstarter and I thought it was too expensive for the Colossus edition and I thought I'm not spending this much money on a gamble somebody teach me this game and then I heard about the retail version and I thought okay this seems good a nice cheaper way to get in but then I heard that components wise and quality of life wise there was a few issues with the retail version and it's like well I'm not going to suffer to have this version that's more reasonably priced <laughs> so you know, I figured I'll wait. And every time it's been on the table at a convention in the UK, I've always been busy doing something else. So finally, Hilmar said, if you haven't played it by Midgard, we're playing it. So we played his Colossus version, the giant one. So the one with all the miniatures, all the big thick tokens, uh, not painted, but you know, all the all the blaz, all the metal coins, everything. The thing that costs like 150 to 200 pounds to buy, you know, this picture version and you know, it's, well, let me get into the art and components first and the value. I think the value is a little bit over the top here. Yes, okay, there are miniatures for this stuff, but you really don't need these miniatures. And it's hard to tell what city and town is what on these things anyway. So unless you paint them, they don't really help to differentiate them anyway. Uh, the tokens are cool and thick, although more on that in a second. Um, and the artwork I find a little bit distracting anyway. I mean, this weird sort of... I mean, I know it's meant to be like a mosaic. I know what they're trying to go with here. But the sea looks really weird in this pattern. You know, you almost think it's like another country or something. And so it just gets a little bit busy on the board. Uh, the cards, they've all got good artwork, though. And the cards are good quality. And the tokens are great quality. And the metal coins are fantastic. You know, there's certainly a good quality in this game. But there's... You know, that does come at a price. I mean, this is the smallest amount of space that the game takes up because this is literally only showing the board, a cards, and a one-player board. But when four of you are playing this game, it's a massive table hog. I mean, the thing takes up so much space that on rectangular tables, we had to basically take up about two or three tables. It was ridiculous. And on top of that, the setup is an absolute pain because you've got to get all your miniatures out and separate them all out, which is not great. Um, then you've got to choose like different, you've got to shuffle the deck of cards and you've got to construct the cards and then you need to do your asymmetric powers, which are cool. I like the fact that it's differentiated starts uh, and various other bits and bobs, you know, it's a lot of that. But these trade tokens, oh my word, this is a moronic way to set the game up. You have to get all these trade tokens with different things on and some of them are blanks. They've got like X's on them and you have to get all of these tokens out of the box, or which there's a ton of them and they're face down. You have to shuffle them up face down. Every single hex on this board that you see here has to be covered with a hex, which is basically anything that is covering a bit of land. So most of them aren't on this board here. Do you think, well, it doesn't look like that many. That's because this is part way through the game. At the start, all of these hexes have a token on them. And it's like, well, what's the big deal? Because when you have covered every single hex, you then flip all the tokens over. And if they have the X on them, they're blank and you remove them. You have to go through this process of shuffling them all, putting them all out, 
only to then remove about 50% of them from the game anyway. This is a stupid way to set the game up, and I wish they had a better way of doing these trade tokens. This would drive me nuts in any setup for this game, and so it's not a game that I want to own. But, as much as I have these negatives with the value and the components and, you know, the, the fact that it's too big and everything, I actually found this to be a very fun game to play. Very fun game. Um, it's most, I was basically following a heavy technology route with, you know, getting a bunch of technologies, getting so much money it hurt, and using the money to get as a, a wild for resources. I did nothing on the map. I literally built one city and one wonder and that was it. I did nothing else on the map at all. I focused entirely on the cards. And I had a good time. It's pretty much... And one thing about this game is that it's deceivingly light. It's not a light game, but it's medium at most. I mean, it's pretty straightforward rules. I mean, you've got some production tracks. One action triggers them. All the actions are written on the board as to how they work and what they cost. Most of them involve the acquisition of cards and the placing of a miniature or something. The technologies and everything prerequisites basically work on the same tableau building iconography tags as terraforming Mars and Earth and Art Nova and all those stuff. So, you know, the rules are so easy to understand. The teach was not very long at all. And before you know it, I was already into the game and trying something out. Now, I do have, as much as I enjoy the game itself and the differentiation and just having some jokes and being like, you know, cool, it's a civilization game, it's abstracted, but it's still you know, a civ game. There are a couple of issues I have with it, though. Um, firstly, you know, this tax tariff bit down here. This is supposed to be a way that you can get money, and it's based on your tax and tariff production as well as other factors. I was the only one who took a single card from here, and that was once, because I had tax and tariff production tracks off the wazoo, so I could get a ton of money, and I used it once. Nobody else used it the entire game. Why is it in the game then? It just seemed a little bit weird. But on top of that, the scoring for this, I mean, there's different ways you score. So you've got the wonders score differently, and, you know, you score for these um, governments that you can do, and, you know, some of the technologies might score for tags, and some of the buildings might score for various set collection stuff. But there's a heavy emphasis on empire scoring, which is this uh, two or three times that will happen in the game, as well as some endgame scoring, which all focuses around area control on this board, getting cities out in the different color regions, having military to bolster that, and basically controlling regions area control. Now, I'd be fine if that was just a side thing in the game that you could aim for, but it seems to be the dominant way to win, and I'm not sure I'm cool with that, because that means the game's going to play out very linear, linear for future games. You know, I want to focus on a couple of other aspects. I mean, I focused a lot on getting money. Money is great for wild resources, but it doesn't score you any other points. That's it. I'm, I'm a one for every ten bucks. And I'm like, seriously? Money. Like, one of the most important things you can have in a civilization, money, and it's worth next to no points. Why? You know, the fact that I could get loads of it as the artist seems to be a negligible thing. The player asymmetric powers don't seem too balanced either. I mean, there are some that, they talk about something called unrest, and some of the leaders get you negative unrest, you know, meaning that you won't lose points at the end of the game for having unrest. But the only way you get unrest is by using the tax tariff thing. So if you don't use that road, and unrest means nothing. So this is supposed to be my advantage for my leader, and it means nothing, whereas other people can get much more useful stuff. So that was a little bit of a hindrance. But yeah, the scoring just felt really geared towards area control. Now, we finished with very tight scores, and I went for no area control whatsoever, and I came second. But that was because we had a weird game where only two empire scoring phases happened. Typically, three happen in this game, from what I'm seeing and what I'm told. So, had we had a third... Uh, well, I mean, I lost anyway with only two empire scorings, and it was close. Had we had a third empire scoring, I would have been absolutely blitzed and probably come last. Because my technologies and stuff like that just don't score enough compared to area control. But what if I don't want to do area control? What if I want to do technologies and, you know, ec you know an e economy run and stuff? I'm not interested in military. Well, apparently you need to get interested in a bit of military and a bit of area control because you're just not going to win stuff. And that's a bit of a put-off. Now, I need to play this game more times to obviously come to a definitive conclusion on that front, but that was just first impressions. Uh, but the game itself is fun. I did enjoy it, and, you know, I think it's too long with too many players. I think this should be capped at three. I think four is a little bit too many, and five and six, by the sound of it, would just be moronic. Why would I ever want to do that? But 
this game is interesting, and I would like to play it again, Colossus version, or maybe even try the retail version to see whether you know putting it down to retail would make it a bit more controllable. But yeah, I'm a little bit concerned about the emphasis on area control. What are your thoughts on that? Is it really that dominant on area control, or you know, is there a way to get around that problem? I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Oh, my poor tonsils. Good thing this is a shorter video, I think, today. All right, uh, what else have I got to talk about? I've done Midgard, done Stargate, I've done that. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, going back to that point I mentioned earlier about the, uh, you know, games not being gateway level. Look at this, right? I think this is me. I think this is when I searched 2023, right? So let's have a look here. Witcher, Old World, Earth, Darwin's Journey, Voidfall, Hegemony, Europa Universus, Expeditions, Beast, Castles of Burgundy Special Edition, Station Fall, you could uh, Star Wars, a deck building game, Mr. President, the American Pres Presidency from GMT, Horses Carriage, the Isovarian Guard, Scarface, Distilled, Unconscious Mind, Marvel Zombies, Age of Innovation, Hop, Hop the Maccas, or whatever the hell Chip Fury calls their game, Seventh Citadel, Disney Locana, Earthborn Rangers, Stellaris, Legacy of You, Heroes of Might and Magic 3, Doom War for Arrakis, Terraforming Mars, the Dice Game, Septima, Fractal, Thunder Road, Archaeus, Lords of Ragnarok. Nucleum Barcelona. Are you noticing something here? Where's the gateway games? They're just not in existence. Now you could argue Disney Lorcana is about a gateway game. Okay, but it's a TCG. Money, 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 money. That's not what I consider suitable for a gateway game. Okay, so what else is there? Uh, anything here at all? Star Wars the deck building game. Not something I would call gateway level. It's light, but it's not gateway level. Castles of Burgundy, again, light. I wouldn't call it a gateway game. Um... It's, and even then, it's a boring game. But, yeah, where am I supposed to find the gateway games here? They just don't exist. And I go down further. Great Western Trail, New Zealand, Skyrise, Archaea Society, Rolling Heights, Zuvardis, Sleeping Gods, uh, The White Castle, I don't know what it is, Total Rome War, Agemonia, uh, Mythwind, open-ended game which blends RPG progression, La Famiglia, Village, Big Box, Search for Lost Species, Free Wing Circus. It's a... I mean, oh wait, Steam Up, A Feast of Dim Sum. That's probably a gateway game, but I haven't seen great reviews for it. Books of Time, Bamboo, Nightmare Cathedral. I mean, that's just... Where are the gateway games? Seriously, publishers, not everything needs to be this big, sprawling, epic mess. You know, simple, nice, light games are cool. I like simple, nice, light games. I like heavy games as well. I like to play a Lacerda and a Mind Clash game every now and again. You know, and I have them on my shelf for that reason. I like open-ended world games i like you know sandbox games i like big epic games every now and again not all the friggin time so come on can we have a few more of these please all right uh topic of the day i just want to talk very briefly about value so uh hear me out here there's a concept that gets talked about lately with value for money when it comes to board games and board gaming is an expensive hobby we know this but it's particularly come up because of the game that I'm reviewing soon, Everdale Farshore. Everdale Farshore has an RRP of £100. £100, $100, or something like that. £100 for this. And after opening the game, getting the stuff out, seeing its production, I can't for the life of me see why it's that much. There's nothing to justify that. You know, yes, there's some nice looking components in there. And yes, the artwork is beautiful, but it is possible to do a gorgeous artwork game for cheap. I mean, for crying out loud, talk to sit-down games, talk to Bombix, talk to any European, uh, yeah, any European publisher. Talk to them about good artwork on the cheap. They can do it, all right? How much does Dixit cost for all the cards and all the artwork it has? You know, it's artwork is not the defining reason why a game should cost an absolute fortune. The component-wise, you get metal anchors, you know, these little things here. Granted, they look cool, but they're unnecessary. it's unnecessary for them to be metal. You get some interesting little components for the resources. Yes, but again, some of them are just wood, whatever. The mushrooms are pretty cool, the little bouncy mushrooms and stuff. But again, £100. Uh, the seaweed is really annoying. It's this tiny little green, uh, like, flappy, sort of bendy stuff. It's really, I mean... It comes in a giant bag. It looks like I'm smuggling drugs. It looks so insane. So the resources aren't enough. The cards, gorgeous artwork, but the cards are pretty 
standard quality. They're pretty thin. And mostly it's because it's got that stupid tower thing in the middle. Um, I probably should get this on the screen, actually, for those watching. But um, I'll show you this this tower. You remember the tree from Everdale? Um, that stupid tree that was unnecessary and blocked line of sight and, you know, people paid loads of money for it. Well, Everdale Farshaw has this tower in it, this lighthouse, which serves no purpose. At least the Everdale... Oh, sorry. Uh, do, 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 there we go. Um, this lighthouse serves no purpose. At least the tree in Everdale had some rules written on it. This doesn't even have that. It is literally there for the card deck to go next to, which makes no difference, and for meeples to go on it that you unlock during the game. Except the lighthouse is not big enough to fit everybody's meeple on it. Trust me, it's an absolute chore to try and get them on there. What is the point? This component is completely unnecessary. And if you're telling me that this cardboard structure, you know, two bits of cardboard with a couple of ledges shoved on it, you're telling me that's a justification for £100, then get stuffed, because that is ridiculous. You could have cut that out of the game entirely and maybe shave some money off it. But, you know, is the game good? You'll have to wait for my review on that. But certainly I am going to make a big deal about the value for money here and the, you know, the fact that this is way too expensive for what it is. People gave me jip for Marvel Dagger for how expensive that one is. And I said that was an expensive game. You know, it's still on my shelf. I've still got it over here. But Marvel Dagger, you know, is still an enjoyable game and it still has a decent amount of stuff in it. But yeah, it's expensive for what it is. And that was at 75, 80 pound. And yet apparently Far Shore for 100 is fair game now granted this is rrp so you will get it cheaper in the shops you well you'll get it cheaper on the line you won't get it cheaper in an flgs but you're still talking 85 to 90 pound to buy it in an online store it's ridiculous at least i can get marvel dagger for 65 70 in an online store that's still cheaper and there's more game in that than there is in farshaw so what exactly is the point of this being expensive it just feels like a cash grab now I'll rant more about that when it comes to the actual review, more than likely. Uh, but, you know, the the thing is with value for money is that uh, some people will claim that it's one of those things that it's relative. Like it's relative to the individual, you know, expensive for you might not be expensive for someone else. But um, I would question that a little bit because firstly, there has to be a point where it's expensive no matter what. You know, just because you might be a multi-millionaire with a ton of cash doesn't mean it's not expensive. I live alone, okay? I live alone. This channel funds itself effectively. Patreons are the reason this thing keeps... Patreons and sponsors are the only reason this channel keeps going because it doesn't make enough money from ad revenue to cover its uh, expenses and stuff. Patreons help keep it going. And, you know, with that this channel able, is able to fund itself. It doesn't make profit. It's not a, you know, it's not a profit-making business or anything like that. It's literally my hobby, okay? I have a job as a tax accountant to pay my mortgage, to pay my electric bill, and, you know, to pay everything else, and to buy a bunch of games to get reviewed. I spend my own cash from that. So, you know, you know value for me is obviously going to be a bit more stringent on that front, but then also, I live alone. I have no spouse, not but entirely by choice, but sadly I don't. Uh, but I also it means I don't have kids. I don't have a pet. I'd love to have a pet. Pets greater than kids, in my opinion. But uh, I live alone and I go out quite a bit. So I, I, you know, a cat, even a cat would get frustrated the fact that I wasn't in the house enough. A dog would go insane. I'd never be able to keep a dog. It would just never get fed or played with enough. So I choose not to have a pet living by myself. As soon if I ever find Miss Wright and move in with them, oh yeah, first thing I want to do is get a pet. You know, hopefully they don't want kids. You know, it's like, you don't want kids? You want a cat or a dog? Perfect. You know, uh, that's what I want to do. But the thing is, is that without those commitments, it gives me a bit more cash on the hip because I got a well-paid job and I live alone. So yes, I've got to pay the bills myself, but you get some reductions by living alone, you know, like council tax and stuff. Not a huge amount, but every little helps. But also my expenses are lower in terms of my, you know, general stuff. I mean, I pay a gym subscription, I get protein powder, I go out to game cafes, I go out for meals, you know, I, you know, I'll go on the occasional trip, I pay fuel, which is expensive in the UK and stuff. So it's not like I'm raking in the, it's not like I'm rolling in it. But the idea is, is that I can live a more comfortable lifestyle. And that, even for someone like me, though, I'm looking at a game and thinking, well, this is pretty expensive. You know, I feel like this is a, a bit much. So to have, 
you know, if I'm thinking the game is expensive, then what's somebody who's not as well off? Who's somebody who's like got a lower paying job or has a family that they have to look after, you know, not so much spare cash on the hip. What do they think the value for these games are? They've got to be thinking that it's way more, you know, way more problematic. So, you know, Everdale Farshaw, for example, £100. Just because you as a multi-millionaire might be able to afford £100 without even breaking a sweat, that's still expensive. I mean, you're paying a lot of money for that. Think what you can get for £100. You know, you can do quite a few things for 100 quid, and you're going to spend it on a small box of cardboard and bits. Do you really think that's justified? I mean, you know, bear in mind, let's uh, take a, like a, uh, let's take a, a tablet. Right, I pay like several hundred quid and get a tablet, you know, a tablet, a uh, digital thing, you know, Samsung, Android or whatever. And that thing will cater for games, it will cater for productivity, it will cater for the internet, it will cater for uh, YouTube, it will get used constantly. It's basically around me at pretty much all times when I'm at home. So, okay, cool. That's getting a lot more value for its money than a box board game is that you might play a few times and then maybe get bored with it or it sits on the shelf. A hundred pound. And, you know, and I mean, you know, I rate on Farshore. I'm talking about Dagger as well. But then remember Skyrim? Oh my God, I mentioned about this. And people were giving me jip on that review as well. Sort of like, oh, you know, ooh, it's, you know, whatever about the cost. I'm sorry, but Skyrim, the adventure board game, sells for something like 150 pound for a retail version and that's not even with the miniatures that's just the game and as my review have said go check out the review the game is pretty lackluster it's not that enjoyable the components aren't very good you know it's a waste of components for the 150 pound it's asking for there is not 150 pound worth of game in this box you know and there's certainly not 150 pound worth of component quality in here you know you know, Marek, Tribe Solo or something, can do his best to make it try and look good on pictures, but there's only so much you can polish a... Yeah, if you know what I mean. So, it's... You know, look at that. I mean, that is what I'm paying £150 for. Blank canvas with a wall of text. You know, that is so bland-looking. And the game is bland-looking. So, why am I paying £150 for this? And that's before you spend, like, £100 on miniatures. And, like, £75 for the expansion. Oh, my word, this is a complete rip-off absolute ripoff no value at all in this so i take value for money pretty seriously when i talk about the review for a game but here's something i'm noticing as i take another swig reviewers seem to ignore this a lot and i'm curious as to why and i also think it's a bad thing because you know, I get the idea that some reviewers might go down this whole value is relative to the individual thing, but I think that's misleading to not talk about value. I think it's better to talk about it from your perspective and make a comment and get the occasional person dispute it than it is to not mention it. Because more people, I think, are going to agree with you on the value front, and a lot of people out there are trying to spend their money wisely. So... Seriously, reviewers, talk about value for money more, because I will, and I shall continue to do so. You try and stab me. It, it's an important factor. You know, I want to recommend a game to someone, and I could have two games that play relatively straightforward, relatively easily, uh, you know, but both are comparable games, okay? They could be two different titles, whatever, okay? So I've got two of them here. And I've got to recommend them to somebody. Like somebody who say, which one should I prefer? I'm fine with both themes. I'm fine with them. The mechanics are roughly the same. So which one do I pick? If one of them gives you a decent looking game and a good experience for about £45, and another one gives you a similar experience, maybe looks a little bit nicer, but is £100, like more than double the cost, I'm going to recommend the £45 one in a heartbeat. Oop, there's a bit of a noise outside. I do apologize if that catches on the uh, microphone. Um, Got to keep the window open because it's humid as all get out today. I mean, we have finally ended the heat wave in the UK. We had a hot day yesterday, and that should be the last hot day of the year, thankfully. But we're going to suffer the aftermath for the next couple of days with some thundery showers and humidity. So that should be fun, but at least no more heat waves. No more heat waves. Can we start autumn, please? Please, please, please. Uh, but anyway, I digress. So, you know, I'm going to recommend the cheaper game. And reviewers just ignore this. You watch any reviewers out there, and I see it a lot. I've seen it on Dice Tower. I've seen it on you know all the all the, well. I've seen it on Dice Tower, Game Boy Geek, you know, 
some of the like other reviewers that I don't trust, you know, that I've watched some of their content, and again, I see them not mention it. Again, this just adds to the problem. But you know, I see it on a lot of reviewers that I do trust, that I do watch, and it's like, okay, cool, I'll watch this content. And again, they don't mention it. You know, it, and occasionally I see snippets and them mentioning it, and this could usually be from small creators. Small creators tend to do this. Hashtag support small creators, but. And I'm so pleased when I see it, but man, it's so rare, and I feel like you need to. You've got to rate a game based on its value for money. You can't say that this is the best game ever, and that's so amazing, and I love it, and everyone should have it, if it costs £200 and is a massive storage fest. You can love Voidfall as much as you like. You can love Gloomhaven as much as you like. You can love, you know, Everdell the complete collection as much as you like. But for the amount of money you're going to spend on it, is it really worth that kind of money? Are you really going to recommend this to everybody for that price tag? You know, you're going to tell your best friend, yeah, go on, spend £150 on that. I mean, what, you wanted some spending money for your upcoming holiday? Nah, you don't need that. Go buy this game for £150. Oh, by the way, you're going to need a big shelf, and you're going to need a lot of hours to invest time in learning the rules and everything, and you're probably going to want to commit this to this for life. Uh, hmm. Problem. <laughs> you know, it's not a good thing. So... You know, I'm curious to know what people's thoughts are. I mean, do you care about the value for a game in a review? Because I'm sure you all care about getting your money's worth for a game. None of you out there could be like, I don't care what it costs. Especially as the board game hobby is getting more expensive now. Kickstarters are now ripping people off, it seems. I haven't backed a Kickstarter in ages now because I just think they're just not worth the price. Which I must admit does put me off doing the monthly Kickstarter videos, but I'm going to try and keep those going. But the... The fact that retail copies are still getting more expensive now. You know, when I see a game do such a good job for such a cheap price, like Alice's Garden. Uh, remember that one I kept raving the praises about? Uh, let me show you that one. And by all means, you need to check out my review for that one if you have not already. Because that one is such an underrated game. 2982, it needs to be higher ranking than that. This is a 30 to 45 minute, 1 to 4 player, polyomino tile laying game. And it comes in a small box. And it sells for like less than 20 quid usually. And like in the UK, you can get it for less than 20 quid. Check out on Kienda, I believe, but I think other retailers might have it as well. Look at this game. Nice, you know, it's got thin cardboard tiles. Yeah, fine. It's not going to like bludgeon someone to death with them. But nice artwork. Looks nice on the table. These green embroidered bags, standard. They're standard in the game. Okay, green embroidered bags with unique designs on them. Okay, you've got simple boards. But again, nice colors. The tiles on there. Unique artwork, very nice and colourful. Uh, this is what you get in the game, so not a ton of stuff, but you get a score pad, you get the rule book, you get the little tiles and stuff, different shapes, all for less than 20 quid. And you want value for money, that's value for money. You know, I cannot recommend this game enough as a gateway level polyomino game. Check out my review for more details. More people need to have this game, I think. It needs to be a gateway staple, and yet it gets no buzz whatsoever other than me because A, it's a gateway game, which means reviewers just don't care about it, but also gamers don't care about it because they just want the next big epic hotness, you know, rather than anything light. And you know, and it's a cheap game, so people just sort of go past it. But it's like, come on. This is value for money. This deserves to be priced higher than £20, and yet it sells for like 15 to £20. It's so cheap. You know, so if they can do it, why the hell can't Everdale Farshore, Skyrim, and, you know, even Gloomhaven. I mean, Gloomhaven sells for a decent amount of money, and you argue that that one's probably got more value for money because it's, uh, you know, a big, sprawling, epic game that literally takes your whole life to finish. But component-wise, it's pretty lackluster, and it's, you know, yes, it's a giant box, but there's nothing in here component-wise that I would give that much credit to. You know, I mean, it's cardboard standees. The artwork is decent enough. The cards are relatively standard. The dice are standard. I mean, it's... Is it worth that much money? Only if you're going to get a lot of plays out of it. But if you can't commit to this game, it ain't worth it. So, you know, I'll leave that one down to debate, I guess. But you could argue that maybe the amount of time it's going to take you to get through the game helps with the value front. But still, there are games that can give you a lot of decent plays and don't take your entire life to commit to. So, you know, reviewers just ignore this. And I've seen like five out of fives i've seen you know nine out of tens i've seen all these really high reviews for everdell farshore now everdell farshore could be a really amazing game we'll find out 
But if I find out that the game is merely fine, you know, lackluster even, and people are giving it nine out of nines, nine out of ten, sorry, five out of fives, and they're ignoring the value front, I'm going to be a little bit annoyed. There could be a rant on that one uh, because you know you are way too forgiving to say a game is that brilliant, that amazing, and not factor the value front to just ignore it. That's misleading, and I think if you're a reviewer and you ignore value for money, you might need to come up with a very good reason as to why in my book, because I will trust your content a lot more for having that in it. And certainly if people mention it in reviews, I will trust their content more for having it in it, and yet a lot of the big names just simply don't do it. And they need to start now. Oh, well, that's a little rant on that. But I'd be curious to know your thoughts. You know, let me know what you think. You know, do you think value for money is important in gaming in general? Do you think reviewers should comment on it more? You know, I talk about it all the time. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? You know, let me know your thoughts in the comments on that one. Uh, in terms of reviews, I just want to quickly mention before I sign off, um, I am thinking about the format again of those reviews because there's just a lot of reviews to do and I'm getting a little bit annoyed that I just don't seem to get enough time to get things like top tens done and the expansion stuff done and things like that which I really do like to talk about. Expansion stuff doesn't get a lot of views but it's important stuff that no one else talks about. Uh, but then I also want to do more of the shelf keep or cull ones. I want to do more of the other type of content not just reviews because reviews are hit and miss with their viewership you know and it hurts the channel to have low views no matter how many videos i put out so i am trying to think about how to do the reviews and i've had a detailed version which i've done for things like marble dagger and expeditions and void for you know big games and i've had the quick draw reviews of which i'm not still not happy with the name but i can't really do much else for it but they work and they allow me to do a review in a bit of quicker time but it varies as to the length and complexity of those as well, because sometimes I can think of some good uh, video skits to put in them, and I'll put them in the video that takes time to edit, but then sometimes I might be talking for a long time in those reviews, because there's more to cover than I originally thought there was, and so it's not so much a quick draw review, it's just a slightly less detailed one. And so I feel like having two different formats is also problematic and the thing is i really like my intro the uh do 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 you know that, yeah that that intro that plays it's kind of a defining intro to my channel and yet it only plays on top tens which i don't do enough of and some of the other content and detail reviews so you're mainly seeing the quick draw intro mostly with my content and that's not my channel that's just another type of intro so I'm curious as to whether I kind of need to condense the two, like really just have one format for reviews and cover all of them in that, whether it's a tiny game or a big game, and try and keep the lengths down, not to have 30 minute extravagant answers. If I have to do part one, part two, part three, then I should do that. Maybe I should stop having one giant long video for a review and instead do it in parts. If it takes me a long time to talk about it, then fine, have Voidful part one, Voidful part two, and then cover it in two separate videos. Release them at the same time, but just keep them in two shorter segments. Or maybe don't keep them at the same time. Maybe leave a week between them, I don't know, like a cliffhanger. But the, the idea is, is that I do need to think about this a little bit, and I'd be curious to know your thoughts. Now, part of the thing that hurts it is what to include in the reviews, because obviously I want to get a decent amount of detail in there. Pros and cons are a must, you know, I've got to do that. And having a pro and con section like in the detail reviews does allow me to structure my videos a lot better. So, you know, I do like having those in. Obviously, you need a final summary and verdict. But with regards to the other bits, especially in the detail review, are they needed? Now, I always give a little bit of a background on the game, so that's fine, that's just a standard thing. But then I also do the rules overview in both, and I find that the rules overview is what is taking up a lot of time in both styles of reviews, and the quick draw and the detail one. And in the detail one especially, it takes a long time to edit that section, because I've got to get all the photos, I've got to do zoom-ins and scrolls and all that lot, and I've got to do, I've got to figure out what I'm saying. I mean, I don't script it entirely, but I still need to, you know, research what I'm doing for that and that section takes a lot of time and do people really care I mean if you want to look up the rules to a game can you not just go on BGG and find it you know I try to give as very brief a rules overview as I can in that section maybe I need to make it briefer maybe I literally do need to give the absolute bare bones brief for a rules overview and keep that length down meaning that I don't have to do the separate section with all the scrolling pictures enough I could literally just do it with pieces on the table because after all I'm doing more of my videos in this room with stuff on the table so 
I could show you the stuff on the table as I'm doing uh, rules explanations. So try to keep that down. Game comparisons. Do you like that section where I compare it to other games and say, like, this is similar to this and all that? I mean, if it's useful, I'll keep it. Fine. You know, I, I'll still keep things like player scaling and stuff at the end. You know, that's always useful. Always, like, uh, reporting on that. But maybe I just need to do one format for all of them and find a way to condense the time down. Like, really condense, like, right, I've got to condense these points down, not do a massive long rules overview. I mean, maybe I should just stop doing the rules overview. I don't know. It saves a good three minutes, four minutes in a detail review. It saves a good five to six in a quick draw review because it's a bit more tighter in a detailed one. So I don't know. I need to figure out what I do. And if I can figure out what I want to do and what people want to see and come up with a good uh, compromise, then I would like to hope that I could make reviews a single format. You know, use a pro and con different section. Have a brief rules overview if necessary. Have game comparison if necessary, but keep it brief. Keep them shorter. Try and condense it. Or just have two-part videos, I don't know. But I need to keep it shorter in the sense that I have... Obviously, I want to be able to edit these very quick. Now, another alternative is that I have... D, uh, a normal review format for the majority of games but then for a lot of these smaller games that don't get a lot of reviews i mean i did leaf recently and i think more people should play it but this is a small game that no one's really heard of and i did like trick takers like aurum and you know various little card games like district noir and stuff that not that many people are interested in but they still i still wanted to talk about them they are the ones that probably should be quick draw reviews and maybe i should just consider not doing singular videos for them i don't know but the problem is if you don't do singular videos, you can't put the video up on Board Game Geek because it won't let you do the same video twice on the site. So if I do a group video, I can only put it on one of those games. I can't put it on all three of them, for example. And that's annoying. So do I do like a... I mean, the, the alternative is that I do a quick draw review style where I basically talk about five games at once in the video and then I split it into different parts solely for the purposes of BGG. So on my YouTube channel, you would see a compendium review of a bunch of small little games that I could talk about in like a couple of minutes each. But then on BGG, it would simply have, you know, the excerpt from my thing. It would like it would have the intro maybe, and then it would have that segment, and then it would just say, check out the rest of the video on YouTube or something at the end. I don't know, like put a little banner or something. And then I could just literally chop the video into little segments and use that for BGG. It depends how much traffic you get, but then putting it on BGG is noticeable, so it's something I want to do. I don't know. Things I need to consider. Food for port. But let me know your comments. Let me know what you think, because obviously this channel is made for you, the viewers. It wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys, so by all means, let me know your thoughts. That's it for me. I need to rest these tonsils now. They are getting a bit sore, so you know, probably no more recording today, but I'll try and get on with editing that uh, um, Lost Ruins of Arnak video, see if I can get that edited today, uh, and release it something like on Tuesday, that'd be good, you know, if, should be able to get it released on Tuesday, I reckon, uh, maybe, no, 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 I reckon I could get it released on Tuesday, even if it's late evening Tuesday, I reckon I can do that then, so, uh, you know, I'll try and get it released for them, but, uh, you know, with the new promo. So that's it for me. I'm going to sign off now. Hope you enjoyed this podcast. Hope you enjoyed it on YouTube if you're watching it on there. By all means, consider subscribing to the channel. Keep that number going. Let me know your thoughts on everything I've said. And check out those reviews. Uh, Leaf, uh, Alice's Garden, Skyrim, you know, all these various games that I've talked about on the show, Voidfall and that. Check out those reviews because I think they're quite important ones. And hopefully I'll be able to get some more content out soon. So uh, take care. And remember, as always, it's only a game. Bye for now. Spend your money wisely.